it is a great privilege to welcome you to today's edition of Word of Life, episode 7. My name is Elon Wanda, and today we are looking at Forgiveness of Sins, series 5, and God willing, uh, this is going to be the last series on this topic and I still want to use this opportunity to let you have it strongly at the back and front of your mind that Jesus has forgiven all your sins and therefore go and sin no more. Amen. Today we are looking at a very important message in first john chapter 1 verse 9 and i would like you to pay a serious attention to this and i believe god will help us understand so much about his love for us in jesus name amen first john chapter 1 verse First of all, throughout the New Testament, we observe that God forgave all our sins. And he used the word forgive as in past tense. So God has already forgiven all our sins. He's not holding any of our sins against us. And we also saw that he forgave all our sins without any condition he didn't give us any prerequisite to follow or any condition to fulfill before he can forgive us our sins he has forgiven us all our sins because of christ because of his own love for us there's nowhere in the new testament that god demands anything from us before he gives us salvation salvation is absolutely free you only believe and you receive in Jesus' name. But now let's look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, which says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all all unrighteousness if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness this may look contradictory to say God is still demanding that we confess our sins before he forgives us. After he giving us all the total assurance that he has forgiven us all our sins. This may also appear as if God doesn't know our sins that's why he's demanding that we should tell him we should confess to him before he forgives us our sins but god is all knowing he knows the end from the beginning and he knows what happens right in the deepest part of the ocean and in the innermost core of the earth he knows everything so how come God will now be demanding that we should confess our sins, we should tell him our sins before he forgives us? After he giving us all assurance and telling us in throughout all the, the New Testament that he has forgiven us all our sins. God is not bipolar. God is not a double standard God. He doesn't say this today 
and then say that tomorrow. That's not God. God doesn't behave that way. God is not schizophrenic. He cannot tell us he has forgiven us all our sins and again demand that we should confess our sins in order to receive forgiveness. So what actually is the problem here? Let's look again at uh, what John wrote again in 1 John chapter, chapter 2, verse 12. 1 John chapter 2, verse 12. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. John here is saying, little children, for his name's sake, for the sake of the name Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. John did not say, for the sake of confessing your sins. No. He didn't say, because you confess your sins, your sins have been forgiven. So John cannot tell little children that their sins were forgiven and still ask them to confess their sins in order to receive forgiveness. That's a wrong theology. John was misinterpreted. He wrote a powerful sermon, but this sermon was mistranslated 300 to 400 years ago during the time of translation. You know, the original Bible was not written in English, right? It was written in Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic before it was later translated 300 to 400 years ago. So take note, the original script do not have punctuations. They don't have chapters and verses. They were added by the translated. And some of those words that were even added were in italics. Sometimes you may be reading, when you are reading especially original Bible, good Bible, you see some words in italic or in a slanted form. Those words are not there in the Bible originally. But because of uh, the sake of better understanding in English, that is why translators uh, thought it wise to add those, those words. So you pay close attention to this. We don't have punctuations, which is, we, ha we don't have comma, we don't have full stop, we don't have colon, we don't have all those things in the original Bible. Now, do you know that punctuations carry their own meanings? I can write a script with a good meaning, but adding just a comma can change the meaning into a different thing altogether just because of one comma. Let's look at some few examples. One. Let's eat Albert. Let's eat Albert. In this example, the writer assumes that Albert is food to be eaten. We are going to eat Albert. Let's eat Albert. We are going to eat Albert. If someone add a comma to the original sentence, it will now become Let's eat Abet. Let's eat, comma, Abet. Meaning, we are eating with Abet. This is an invitation to Abet to join eat a particular food. To join us eat a particular food. Let's eat Abet. In the first sentence, Abet is a food to be eaten. But in the second sentence, Abed is not a food, rather he is coming to eat with us. This is, 
the same choice of words, the same positions, but just an introduction of comma has given a different meaning to the sentence at, at whole. Now, one could destroy the life of Abed. That is the sentence. Number one, could destroy the life of Abed, whereas the other could be an invitation to Abed to dine. The same way if Jesus said, eat my body, this means the body of Jesus is food and he is instructing us to eat his body, perhaps as part of communion. But if a translator thinks that, ah, uh, how can you eat the body of Jesus Christ? And he decides to add a comma. It will now be like, eat my body this time around jesus is referring to his own body to eat or to make merry eat my body do you see how a little comma or a dot can change the meaning of a whole sentence now a text of scripture today can never mean what it never meant when it was first written. A text of scripture today can never mean what it never meant thousand years ago when it was written. So what John wrote two thousand years ago can never have a different meaning today if punctuations are not added. It can never have a different meaning if no other word is added to what John wrote. Now, let's, let's look at one more example then we come to our main text. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, is also the Messiah. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, is also the Messiah. This is referring to Jesus, the Prince of Peace, as the Messiah also. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, is also the Messiah. But if a translator changes the position of the comma, the sentence will now become, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, is also the Messiah. First, the sentence was, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, is also the Messiah. Second, the sentence becomes, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, is also the Messiah. Now, in this second sentence, this one is telling Jesus that the Prince of Peace is also the Messiah. This sentence is not referring to Jesus as the Messiah. It was rather telling Jesus about a different person who is the Messiah. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, is also the Messiah. And then, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, is also the Messiah. Now, let's come to our text, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What John originally wrote without any punctuation and without some of those slanted words was, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins is faith, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is what John originally wrote. So we took off the punctuations, and then we also took off. There is an hour that was written in 
uh, a slanted form that was written in italics we took it also because it was not in the original text that john wrote so if we properly position the comma it will now become if we confess comma our sins he jesus is faithful and just to forgive us sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we confess our sins he jesus is faithful and just to forgive us sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness since god has already told us he has forgiven us all our sins he cannot again demand that we should confess our sins before he forgives us so this was what the writer was originally saying that if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness this is exactly what the the writer originally meant when he wrote this scripture now what at all is the writer john asking us to confess he's asking us to confess jesus as our lord and savior when we confess jesus as our lord and savior he cleans us from all our unrighteousness he forgives us all our sins let's look at some few uh, scriptures that supports that uh, matthew chapter 10 verse 32 it says whosoever therefore shall confess me that's jesus talking whosoever therefore shall confess me jesus before men him will i confess also before my father which is in heaven so the word confession is not only talking about you mentioning sins anytime it is used in the bible it does not always means that you should mention your sins or you should tell your sins to someone or to god no now philippians chapter 2 verse 11 says and that and that every tongue should confess that jesus christ is lord to the glory of god the father and that every tongue should confess every tongue should confess that jesus christ is lord to the glory of god the father hallelujah romans chapter 10 verse 9 to 10 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the lord jesus and shall believe in thy heart that god have raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved verse 10 for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation now john himself confirmed what he was saying first in john uh, first john chapter chapter 1 verse 9 he now confirmed it again in first john chapter 4 verse 15 which says whosoever shall confess that jesus is the son of god god dwelleth in him and he in god whosoever shall confess that jesus is the son of god god dwelleth in him and him in god this is exactly what the apostle john was asking people to confess whenever we confess jesus as our lord and our savior he we receive salvation anytime a sinner 
believes and confess Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, Jesus cleans him from all his unrighteousness and forgives all his sins. That is why when you go to preach, you don't ask people to tell God all their sins they have ever committed in life before they receive salvation. No. You rather ask them to confess Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. And that is exactly what gives salvation. God already knows we are sinners. That is why he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for us. And none of our sins are hidden from him. He only wants us to acknowledge that we are sinners and confess Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Then we receive forgiveness for our sins. That is in the case of a, a new believer or someone who is now uh, trying to become a believer. Someone who is now coming to be led to receive salvation. Now, let's move on. There's another scripture that talks about confessing faults. But this one is confessing faults to one another. James chapter 5 verse 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availed much. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availed much. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may receive, that ye may be healed. Amen. When I wrong my neighbor, when I sin against my neighbor, I need to go and confess to him. I need to go and tell him my fault, what I have done wrong against him, and ask for forgiveness. This is in place, and it is right. But with God, who has already forgiven us all our sins, he is not expecting us to approach him in a slavery manner, begging for forgiveness always. He said he has already forgiven us all our sins. So he's not expecting us to come uh, begging, rolling on the ground, hitting our head against the wall, and always begging for forgiveness, which he said he has forgiven us again. All that God is expecting us as believers, as children, is to come boldly to the throne of grace with thanksgiving and with praise unto his holy name. Thank him for forgiving you all your sins and bless his name for cleansing you once and for all. That is what God is expecting from a believer. But from a non-believer, God is expecting that you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior and then you receive salvation that he has given to you. Hallelujah. When you examine the Greek words that was used, 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 used the word homologio which means to say the exact thing like the one, like the other, or to agree with. To say the exact thing like the other, or to agree with. You have to agree with us. You have to agree with Jesus. And you have to agree with other believers that Jesus is our Lord. And Jesus is our Savior. God said, Behold, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. You have to agree 
with God. You have to agree with the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. That is the Greek word that was used in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, homologio. If you don't agree with God that Jesus is the Son of God and you jump on the street telling people your sins, confessing your sins here and there, you have no salvation. I'm telling you, my friend. Now, James chapter 5, verse 16, also used the Greek word esomologio. Esomologio, which also means to confess or to profess. To declare oneself guilty of what one is accused of. Esomologio. So you could see that these two Greek words are different. So you need to properly study the word of God in order to understand so that you don't go about doing what God is not asking you to do. Now, must I become an English scholar in order to understand Bible? No, not at all. You don't have to be an English scholar. You don't have to hold ph dot d in english before you can understand bible before you can interpret bible no number one you must first of all be born again and number two you need to tune to the help and to the leading of the holy spirit and number three you must follow the rules of bible interpretation hallelujah before we come to the end of this series i would like you to pray this prayer with me you might be attending church for many years but didn't have salvation you might be a pastor even but didn't understand how much god loves you and you are willing to experience the love of God, this love flowing in your life. I want you to pray this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for your grace, for your love, and for your mercy. I thank you for paying the price for all my sins. I confess you as my Lord and my Savior. I receive salvation and the forgiveness of sins by grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello, my friend. You are blessed. Begin to experience and enjoy the love of God that he has bestowed upon your life in Jesus name Amen uh, I also like you to subscribe to my channel along wonder or along wonder word of life on YouTube and follow the rest of my teachings and the previous ones that I have done. And trust me, you'll be blessed so much in Jesus' name. On this note, thank you very much. I remain blessed. Amen.